Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle with Treble Health, and today I'm going to be reviewing Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is a disease of the inner ear that affects both hearing and balance. It was first described in the mid-1800s by French physician Prosper Meniere who the disease is named after. It's considered to be a chronic condition, but there are many different treatment options that help improve the quality of life and reduce the symptoms of Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease most commonly happens in one ear, but it is possible to have Meniere's disease in both of your ears. It also tends to begin in young adulthood or middle-aged adulthood. Sometimes Meniere's disease is also referred to as cochlear hydrops or endolymphatic hydrops, And that's because of the increased hydraulic pressure in the inner ear's endolymphatic system. What are the symptoms of Meniere's disease? So as I already discussed, it's a disease that affects the inner ear. So there's both auditory and vestibular components to it. More commonly than not, individuals who have Meniere's disease will experience fluctuating hearing loss, episodes of dizziness, episodes of oral pressure or ear pressure, as well as intermittent tinnitus. For the most part, these symptoms occur in episodes. So an individual may experience fluctuating episodes of dizziness. Typically, the episodes will last about 20 minutes, no more than 24 hours, fluctuating hearing loss. So there'll be times where they feel like their hearing has dropped, and then after some time, their hearing has maybe returned completely or at least partially, as well as bouts of tinnitus. Some individuals will experience tinnitus before having an episode of dizziness or hearing loss. Others may experience tinnitus um, more constant throughout their day. And the symptoms of ear pressure are also a telltale sign. So an individual may feel that one or both of their ears constantly feels a little bit of pressure or buildup. After an episode, the symptoms tend to resolve or at least improve. And over time, individuals who experience those fluctuations in hearing loss may eventually end up having some permanent hearing loss. So typically at the beginning or early stages of Meniere's disease, when someone experiences a fluctuation or drop to their hearing, their hearing tends to return back to normal after the episode has finished. But over time, their hearing may not entirely return and they may be left with some degree of hearing loss. Some of the factors that may lead to abnormal endolymph fluid within the inner ear may be because of an anatomical abnormality or a blockage within the inner ear. It can also maybe be due to genetics or an autoimmune response or even a viral infection. In regards to the genetic predisposition of Meniere's disease, it typically doesn't run in families, but a small percentage of individuals have been found to have Meniere's disease within their family line. So there may be some small genetic component and that's still continuing to be evaluated. The research shows that it's likely following an autosomal dominant pattern, meaning that one or both of your parents have Meniere's disease, and therefore you're more likely to have Meniere's disease. How is Meniere's disease diagnosed? More commonly than not, your ENT or otolaryngologist will be the one who diagnoses you with Meniere's disease. And you're diagnosed based off of your symptoms, as well as some results of audiological and vestibular testing. So more commonly than not, you have to have experienced at least two bouts of vertigo, which lasted at least 20 minutes, but no more than 12 hours. You should also have episodes of fluctuating hearing, bouts of tinnitus or constant tinnitus, as well as episodes of oral fullness, ear fullness or pressure. You don't have to be experiencing all of these symptoms, So you just have to have at least a few of these co-occurring at the same time in order to receive a diagnosis of Meniere's disease by your physician. Your physician may then refer you to an audiologist to have your hearing tested as well as to have your vestibular system assessed. So you're likely to have several hearing tests to determine if in fact your hearing is fluctuating. And if your hearing is fluctuating, we would wanna determine the degree of the hearing loss that you are experiencing, if any. And in terms of the vestibular testing, there are several different types of vestibular testing that you may have completed, but more than likely you're going to have a VNG, which stands for video nystagmography testing. And this is a test that requires you to wear goggles and you're going to have your eye movements monitored. The visual and vestibular system work together. And so we can't exactly see what's happening inside of your head, inside of your vestibular system, but we can see if there's anything that's happening abnormally based off of how your eyes respond as you complete different tasks. 
so we can determine whether or not the issue is arising from either the central vestibular system or the peripheral vestibular system, essentially either the inner ear or the brain. As part of your VNG test, you may also have rotary chair testing completed, which is another way to assess how the vestibular system is responding to motion. So you'll be wearing goggles, sitting in a chair that rotates in different directions for different periods of time at different speeds, and it's a way of measuring, again, how the vestibular system responds to actual head motions. You may also have an ECOG or electrocochleography testing completed, and this is a test that requires you to have electrodes placed in your ear as well as on your head and face and we're able to measure if there are any abnormal pressure changes that are occurring in response to sounds within your inner ear. You may also have VEMP testing, which is vestibular evoked myogenic potential testing, and that also requires you to wear electrodes on your neck, an earphone in your ear, and it checks to see how the inner ear specifically either the utricle or the saccule are responding to sound, to pressure changes, to actual muscle contractions in the neck. You may also be referred for posturography testing. This is another test to assess how the balance system is functioning. So you'll be harnessed, standing barefoot on a platform and your balance will be assessed in different types of conditions. You may also have VHID testing completed, which is a newer test. It stands for Video Head Impulse Test and it uses abrupt head movements to measure how your eyes are responding to assess whether or not there's any abnormalities within the vestibular system. Hearing ENT may also refer you for blood tests to make sure that there's nothing else that's causing these same types of symptoms of dizziness, hearing loss, tinnitus, or oral fullness. And along those same lines, you may be also referred for imaging studies. So either a CT scan or an MRI to make sure that there's nothing else that is related to the symptoms that you're experiencing. This is a short break from today's video to announce the Tinnitus Guide by Treble Health. Do you want to learn about the newest tinnitus treatments and management tips? Click the link in the description of this video to get your free copy of the Tinnitus Guide by Treble Health. What treatment options are available for Meniere's disease? I'm going to break it into two categories, non-invasive treatment options and invasive treatment options. One of the first things that someone's asked to do if they're suspected of or recently diagnosed with Meniere's disease is to go on a low sodium diet. This helps with fluid retention. You may also wanna reduce your alcohol, caffeine, or nicotine use because this too can contribute to fluid retention. In terms of medications that are used to treat and manage Meniere's disease, one of those includes diuretics. Again, diuretics have the same purpose as going on the low sodium diet. They're meant to help reduce water retention or fluid retention within the body. You may also be prescribed motion sickness medication or anti-nausea medication. So meclizine is often prescribed for the symptoms of dizziness and vertigo, and promethazine is often prescribed to address the nausea that is accompanied by the episodes of dizziness and vertigo. Sometimes you can take these preventatively, so if you're starting to feel as though you're going to have an episode of Meniere's disease, then you might want to take it beforehand to try to reduce the severity of the vertigo and nausea or you can try to take it during an episode, depending upon how long it lasts. Hearing aids are often recommended and dispensed for individuals with hearing loss. In regards to the hearing loss that an individual with Meniere's disease may have, we often recommend hearing aids. Hearing aids help to address the hearing loss, and you can also have built-in masking therapy that helps address the tinnitus that often accompanies Meniere's disease. Most hearing aids nowadays also have Bluetooth, so you can stream different sounds to help alleviate the symptoms of tinnitus that you're having. And oftentimes an individual will have different programs that help to match the different fluctuations in their hearing that they may experience as a result of Meniere's disease. And of course, they will also have access to volume control both on their devices as well as through their app that they may use as a remote control from their phone. If your balance has been impacted as a result of the episodes of Meniere's disease, then you may also work alongside a vestibular rehabilitation therapist to help build up your balance and help reduce the risk of falls, as well as to give you other strategies that may help you better improve your balance throughout the day. Now I'm going to go into some of the more invasive 
treatment options for Meniere's disease. If your episodes of vertigo and dizziness are beginning to be debilitating to you, then your physician may recommend middle ear injections. These middle ear injections are meant to help reduce the amount of sensory input that your vestibular system is giving to your brain. They often help to reduce the frequency and severity of your vertiginous episodes. So sometimes an individual may receive gentamicin injections in their middle ear or they may receive steroid injections in their middle ear. Gentamicin is an ototoxic medication, so it actually causes harm to the auditory and vestibular portions of the inner ear. So it's really only used, again, if someone's having extreme and debilitating episodes of vertigo, because by using this, you're not only impacting the vestibular system, but you're also impacting your hearing. So you may have a reduction in the episodes of dizziness, but you may also start to notice that your hearing is declining more and more. Steroids aren't as effective at managing the episodes of vertigo as gentamicin is, but it is less likely to harm your hearing. So that's something to consider and discuss with your physician if you are moving towards the route of more invasive treatments for your Meniere's disease. There are also a few surgical options for treating the symptoms of Meniere's disease. Again, these are only really reserved for individuals who are experiencing extremely debilitating episodes of vertigo. So the three most common procedures include vestibular nerve section, labyrinthectomy, and an endolymphatic sac procedure. Vestibular nerve section actually cuts the vestibular portion of the eighth nerve, thereby disconnecting the communication between the inner ear and the the central vestibular system at the level of the brain. A labyrinthectomy is a surgical procedure that removes the balance portion of the inner ear. It by default then damages both the vestibular system and the auditory system. And for this reason, it's only ever reserved for individuals who have complete or nearly complete loss of hearing in the affected ear. The last surgical procedure that is sometimes considered for individuals who are having debilitating symptoms of Meniere's disease is endolymphatic sac procedure. This is a procedure that tries to decompress the endolymphatic sac within the inner ear. So it's meant to help reduce the fluid retention and oftentimes a tube or a shunt is placed to help with that fluid drainage. If after learning a little bit more about Meniere's disease, you suspect that your tinnitus may be the result of Meniere's disease, then follow up with your local otolaryngologist to begin the diagnosis process. If you already have a diagnosis of Meniere's disease and have any other tips to help share with other viewers, please comment below. And if you're not already a subscriber to our channel, please hit the subscribe button so that you can watch all of the latest videos that we post on our Treble Health channel. If there are any other questions that you have about Meniere's disease, please feel free to comment below and we'll try to reply back as soon as we can.